Hello, my name is Ken Kinter and I'm an assistant professor at Rutgers University. The purpose, or I should say purposes of this video are to provide an introduction to stages of change and motivational interviewing. Now elsewhere on the Rutgers State Hospital website, uh, you can find this version of the video, but it's broken out into five smaller videos. So um, that one will be better if you wanna see this in small pieces. If you wanna do the whole thing one time, you're in the right place. And also you've got my uh, information here on the title slide. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or if you want any additional information. Now, before we get rolling, gotta give credit where credit is due. Uh, the New Jersey Department of Health has been sponsoring uh, the State Hospital Psychiatric Rehabilitation Initiative, which is where I work. Uh, and it's located in all of New Jersey state psychiatric hospitals. And our mission is to improve the care and the working conditions in those hospitals. Uh, without the uh, Department of Health support, this mission would not be possible. So they make this video possible and a lot of the work that we do. So we are grateful for that. So there's a lot of ground to cover in this uh, long video. So here are my wildly optimistic objectives, otherwise known as woo, because that's what I'm going to say when we get through all of them. So we're going to do an overview of stages of change. If you're familiar with them, it'll be a review or it might be an introduction, how they work. We also want to talk about strategies that are specific to each stage. We're going to do a little test. Uh, we'll do vignettes on that. Then we'll do an overview of motivational interviewing, the spirit, the tools, uh, the process, uh, sustain and change talk. And then we'll talk about what the next step might be uh, for you to go from there. If you want to learn more about motivational interviewing, I definitely suggest you do. Uh, I've been in the mental health system for about 30 years now, and it's one of the, I would say, major, two or three most major discoveries for me along this path. And it's really changed how I do what I do. So stages of change. If you haven't seen these before, we're going to be reviewing these stages, starting with pre-contemplation, and working our way all the way through contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. We'll be talking about relapse as well. So we're gonna spend a little time on each of those steps and then go through each of those steps again regarding strategies. What I'd like you to do as we talk about these stages is think about your own life and think about changes that you either are making, may make at some point, or have made, and think about how these stages work for you. Let's not think about this in terms of clients yet. Let's think about this in terms of you and your own life. So pre-contemplation. Pre-contemplation is when the person, I love the quote here, it isn't that they can't see the solution, they can't see the problem. So you've probably had this experience before where people around you might be indicating to you that there might be something that you might want to think about changing and you're just not hearing it. Uh, and you probably have a very valid reason for not hearing it, even if change was the right thing to do later on. No intention of changing the problem. The person wants to change the, pe the people around them so that whatever they're doing is okay. Commonly, this is what we call denial. Uh, very often they are demoralized, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. They don't want to know. Uh, I've heard pre-contemplation broken into two different pieces. The pre-awareness, or what I've heard uh, referred to as anti-contemplation, where I, I'm putting active energy into not hearing about this. Uh, where I used to work on an inpatient unit, we had a smoking cessation group, and there was a woman that I would invite to come to the smoking cessation group, and she would give me the finger every time I asked her uh, if she wanted to come to group. So I took that as a sign that she did not want to attend the group because I'm pretty smart like that. Uh, and so we might talk about her a little later about how to deal with that, a sort of obvious resistance. So to capture pre-contemplation, I don't have a problem. That's the summary of it. So people can be in pre-contemplation for a long time and then either something shifts internally or externally to move them into contemplation. So contemplation is best pictured by a scale. You've got the argument to change here and the argument to stay the same here and they're roughly in equal balance. Uh, people are stuck in this stage for years. Uh, we've heard of this stage as the but stage and but is spelled properly. Uh, I, I think contemplation is captured by the following uh, situation. I want to quit smoking, but I have a very stressful job. So did you hear how the word but was the pivot between the two? I know I need to quit smoking, but I have a stressful job. And that's the impasse between the two. Uh, people can spend a long time here. Uh, and the primary reason, as we'll talk about later on, is they're afraid to fail. Part of the reason that people don't move forward is because we fear change is too big or we make change too big. Classic example, 
someone says, oh, well, I want to lose 30 pounds. Okay, well, that's not easy. That's a big job. If you haven't lost 30 pounds in your life, you're talking about doing something that you've never done before. The other issue is, is losing 30 pounds really what you want to do? Uh, Oprah talks about losing 30 pounds all the time. It's the same 30, and I can relate. So is that really what you want to do? And does that make it harder to do than I want to lose five pounds? Because you got to lose one pound or five pounds before you lose 30. And your goal is more about taking weight off and keeping it off. Losing one pound is a lot less daunting than 30, but one is a necessary path to get to 30. So just the way we talk about change sets us up for failure sometimes. How about, um, well, I tried to quit smoking and I failed. Well, if you quit smoking for a month, you actually successfully quit smoking for a month. Is that worse than had you not tried to quit at all? So again, we'll talk more about change talk, but that's kind of, those. these are some of the traps that we make for ourselves. So next up is preparation. And this is where there's plans to take action. And there may be, be some changes actually happening here, but it's not the actual change. Uh, and this is captured by I'm making a plan to help with my problem. My favorite example of a preparatory step is one of my own. And that is, I, uh, I joined a gym. That's it. I joined a gym. I never went back again. Now, is that a step of action? No, it was a preparatory step. And they were calling me and nagging me. Apparently, you have to keep going back. I'm like, look, I, I signed up. I'm paying my money. Leave me alone. I didn't lose any weight or anything, but that was kind of how that worked. So there are steps in preparation, but action is really day one. Action is the first day of that diet, the first day quitting smoking, the first day doing this thing. And it's usually very difficult. It's usually very difficult because it takes all sorts of energy to make this change happen. It's also difficult because we're doing something different and all of our habit energy is pushing us in the direction of doing what we always did. And also new stressors arise due to change. Um, my friend actually gave me the best uh, example of this, the one that I like. And that is, he was overweight. He did the same thing I did. He joined a gym and he announced to his wife that he was, he joined the gym and that he was going to be going to the gym three evenings a week to get himself in better shape. Now that's a good thing. She supported him in that endeavor. However, she had some questions because she hadn't been consulted about this. She didn't know where the money was coming from. And she was just finding out that she was babysitting their three sons three evenings a week. And maybe she would have better off been consulted about that, or that's something that you got to work out in the planning stage before action comes around. Poorly planned interventions fail. So that's an example of a new stressor arising due to change. Where's this time going to come from? What's it going to be taken away from? Where's the money going to come from? How mad is my wife? Things like that. Uh, and the action stage is where visible change actually starts to happen. Uh, if you want to see the action stage, join a gym right after New Year's Day. That's, that's when you want to see the action stage in progress, usually with some poor planning. So by February, it's back to normal again. So maintenance. Maintenance is when the change has been going on long enough where it gets easier. Now, the book will tell you that maintenance starts to happen around six months. To me, it seems really arbitrary. For me, if I have a new habit going for three weeks, I've got momentum and I'm likely to keep it going. Other people who've been involved in, say, smoking for a very long time, it's a lot longer than six months. It's really individual. Um, I think the thing that you want to look for is when does it get easier? That's what you're looking for. It doesn't take as much energy to maintain the change. If something happens to stop you from making that change, now you're angry instead of secretly relieved. Um, and this is kind of captured by the expression, I'm working on it and it's getting easier. So I would ask you to think about that for a change that you've had in your life. When did it get easier? If you went on a diet or quit smoking is probably my favorite example. When did it get easier? Did it get easier? So now, so far, we've only talked about mo movement forward through the stages. But as we know, change is not a point A to point B proposition. It's one step forward, two steps back. Uh, and that's an important point to know uh, going forward. So relapse is when there's movement back through the process. If you've ever been ready to make a change, Wednesday's the day, I'm going to do this. And then Wednesday morning rolls around and no, it's not going to happen. Um, it usually involves going back to contemplation. Think about people who, uh, I would say, serial dieters, people who've gone through many diets. They try a diet, it doesn't work. So they say that diet doesn't work and they go back to, all right, I don't know what to do until the next diet comes around. A um, couple things about relapse or what they, what they call it recycling now. First of all, it's to be expected. If you're making a big life change, 
I don't expect anybody to get it right the first time. You didn't catch a ball the first time somebody threw it to you. You didn't ride a bike successfully the first time they put you on a bike. You learn by falling and you learn by dropping the ball. That, that, this is how we learn and it's okay. You have to learn how to quit smoking for a day before you learn how to quit smoking for a week, before you learn how to quit smoking for a month, a year, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, as you see here, smokers tend to quit three to six times before they have a long lasting quit interval because they're learning how to quit and they're learning the things that trigger them back in again. New Year's resolutions take up to five different tries before they succeed. That's five years. That's a long time because these are major changes in someone's life. Now, the vital part, we'll talk more about this when we get into strategies, is instead of the person going back to contemplation, let's go back to the plan. Let's go back to preparation. How didn't we plan properly? We had a gentleman that was admitted to our state hospital, I think it was four times in a year, which is a lot. And he, didn't, he according to him, he did not have a mental illness, did not have a drug problem. He, his parents just needed to stop calling the police on him. So this sounds like what stage, right? This sounds like pre-contemplation. So he wasn't hearing anything we had to say, was just, just did what he needed to do, got out of the hospital, was back three weeks later. Didn't hear anything we had to say again. Now he's even more angry because he's come back in again. You know, we're catching him fresh off of this relapse. So he goes back out of the hospital and he's back in again in about a month. So on this occasion, he said, you know what? The medication was helping me with my temper. Okay, so we've got something. So by the third stay, he's taking medication. And, but when he came in the door, he was so angry, angry at his parents and angry at all that stuff. So my angle with him was to say, um, what is it that's happening that's causing you to come back in the hospital? Well, I have arguments with my family and they call the police. So then we started targeting these arguments. What can you do to prevent from getting an argument with your family? And we came up with, we'll take a walk. So when he came in the third time, I said, what happened? What happened with our plan? He said, it rained. And I immediately said, so instead of scrapping the plan, I said, oh my God, what a terrible plan we made. What a terrible plan we made. We didn't even have the condition of, of rain. We got to come up with a rainy day plan. So we built onto the plan that he would listen to music. He would go in his room, put his headphones on and listen to music and calm down. So again, we're working with someone who is still not owning that they have a mental illness, still not owning that they have an addiction, but is willing to mod modify some parts of their behavior. And we don't throw out the change plan when they come back in again. So this is captured by I messed up and. Now, a couple other details about the stages. Stage of change is constantly changing. Uh, you can be in multiple stages in the course of a given day. The mistake that we make, the textbook mistake that we make is we get out in front of the client. We are into the action stage. They're not. So it's that whole metaphor about don't lead, don't follow, walk beside. This is about walking beside. If we get a step out in front of the client, resistance will be the result. We will create the resistance by pushing that person in a direction that they don't want to go or pushing them faster than they want to go. If you're walking down a hallway and I come up behind you and I grab you and I start moving you faster in the direction that you were going, you will A, be rightfully freaked out, and B, you'll probably resist to some level. And I was like, well, wait a minute, I'm moving you in the direction that you wanted to go and faster. It's not okay for a multitude of reasons. The other significant point here is that people are in different stages for different things. So below, so it's not like one per, if you're not a pre-contemplator, you're not a contemplator, People are in different stages for different things. So take this example at the bottom. People are, uh, you have a, a sample case here where someone is in pre-contemplation about smoking pot, preparation about cocaine use, and contemplation about cigarette smoking. Now, if you were working with this client, how would you come at them? Now take a look. So they're in pre-contemplation about smoking pot. I don't have a problem. Preparation about cocaine use, putting together a plan. Contemplation about cigarette smoking. I know it's a problem, but I don't know what to do. So if you said, should we come at all of them? One of them? So if you said preparation about cocaine use, you are correct. But now let's see if you're double correct. Why? It isn't because cocaine is the most dangerous of the drugs, although that's an easy place to go. It's because it's there the furthest along in that step. They're in preparation already. So instead of fighting a fight you're not going to win about pot or trying to overcome ambivalence about the contemplation about cigarette smoking, they're ready for a plan about cocaine. Let's make it work. And while we've done two very important things by doing this, one, we've shown respect to the client and met them where they are 
in this change process. And two, we are gonna be doing some of the work about pot and cigarette smoking while we do the cocaine thing, but we are not creating resistance by coming straight at it. We're moving, along, we call it coming alongside, moving with the client and rolling with their resistance. We'll get into that later on in the motivational interviewing stuff, but that's an important point. So let's move on to the strategies, back to pre-contemplation. So this is for the person that does not have a problem. My, my biggest recommendation would be explore their defenses by hearing them out. Listen to their story. Uh, you need to find out the reason why they don't believe they have a problem, because that's significant, uh, because that's the opponent. You know, if you look at the change as a process where here's the, the reason to change, here's the reason to stay the same, I almost compare this to when they introduce two boxers or two MMA fighters. You see their names, their ages, their record, their reach, their weight, all that stuff. You got to know both sides. Got to know both sides of this equation because that's, that's what you're up against. Find self-defeating uh, beliefs. Don't push the agenda. If you're going to say something somebody has already told them and they've ignored it, save your breath. What are the relationships? What are the supports? While they're telling you about all the reasons why their version of the situation, you can be finding spots where you might be intervening later on. You're kind of, to me, this is like where you get the topography of the change process for the person. You offer support, you offer options, and be ready for the no when it happens. They might have their own version of help that maybe there's some way you can negotiate that. This gentleman I was talking to about who was hospitalized four times in one year, when he came in the fourth time, he said, I don't think I can live at home anymore. Now you notice he's still not moving in the direction of acknowledging a mental illness, but now he's taking medication and he's trying to make other changes in his life. And maybe that will work, and maybe that won't. I haven't seen him at the hospital since, so I don't know what that means. But he was working his way through the change process. And by me trying to inflict change, getting him to acknowledge a diagnosis, I just slow the train down. So strategies for contemplation, the scales. This is where you present all of that great information that you have. You're not trying to sell it. You're just saying, hey, here's the information. Explore the sense of urgency around this. Why now? Why do we need to do this uh, change now? What's their level of arousal about it, agitation about it? I specifically love how does the problem conflict with the person? For example, if you have someone that is a, a really, someone I worked with a really severe alcoholic, now, where would you say where it conflicts with the person? So he, we had heard he had been married and had kids. So we said, well, aren't you concerned about the effect of the alcohol on your relationship with your kid? I don't see my kid. Okay. Uh, how about your relationship with your wife? My wife divorced me and doesn't let me see the kid. Okay. All right. We're out on that one. Well, how about your job? I got fired from my job because of drinking. Okay. So he's lost all those things. So all these places where I'd be looking for a person conflicting isn't there. What did we find? Turned out this person used to be a police officer. And he said, you know what I really hate about drinking is that now when I get drunk, they got to pull an officer out of the station or off the street to come bring me into the emergency room. And I used to be that guy and I used to hate bringing all these drunks in and now I'm that drunk. Okay, that's what we need. That's the dissonance that we're looking for to move further on through the stages. Begin self-monitoring. Don't change anything, just monitor what it is. Sometimes the idea when somebody starts counting their cigarettes or, or tracking how much money they spend through their addiction or anything else that they track, part of being in that pre-contemplation contemplation stage is minimizing the problem. And when you really look at it in front of you, that becomes harder to do. ABCs, all my psychologists out there know this one already, antecedent behavior consequence. What are the triggers that start this behavior? What's the payoff for this behavior? What's the sequence? The more the person knows about that cycle of, of behavior, the better off they are. And what you wanna make is a decisional balance. It's like a, a pro and con list. In fact, uh, in motivational interviewing, they really do this great pro and con list. It's a two, two by two pro and con list. You can reach out to me and I'll, I'll send it to you. So it's the reasons to change, the reasons to not change, um, the benefits and, and deficits of change. So you make that balance, what's on both sides for that person in the change process. So for preparation, now we've identified this is the pump the brake stage. Very often, we are in the action stage. We've been taught to work with people in the action stage, move them forward, get them going. And the clients are usually more in pre-contemplation and contemplation. That's where most people are at any given point in time. So 
as soon as that person gives us a little daylight and says, you know what, maybe I do need to go to rehab. Maybe I do need to take medication. You know what, I'll go, I'll go to group tomorrow and you know, we'll check this out. We get all ready. And then that person changes their mind. And we go through that loop a few times and then we say, oh, well, this person doesn't want help. All of this is wrong. What we did was we, over, we overshot. So when someone gets to preparation, I want to see a written change plan. I want to see a, a change plan. I want to see the blueprint before we build the house. And if they're not willing to draw up the blueprint, they're not going to build the house because building the house is a lot harder. So it's just about making the plan. So this is the pump the brakes. Instead of putting yourself out and doing all this work and trying to pave the road for the person, let's say, okay, how are you going to do this? Let's sit down and let's do this. A great question is, what will you have to give up to do this? Any positive change in your life is going to require for you to give up something. And not wanting to give up that something or the perception of giving up something stops the change plan in its tracks. How are they going to deal with the anxiety of change? Change is stressful. The, change, uh, the stress of change is like the stress of fear of death. Uh, that's how people are, are so afraid of it. How do we make this job smaller? How do we make the 30 pounds into one pound? How do we make this more manageable? Every big job is a bunch of little jobs all glued together. So well, how about we take them apart and take out the little jobs one at a time? And again, you need to see that written plan. The written plan is the blueprint for change. So the action stage, don't start until you're ready. This is a marathon, not a sprint. It doesn't have to be today. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. We want it done right, not right now. Uh, deal with the remaining change myths. What is the person telling themselves about change? How are they talking themselves out of change? And we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more later. Now we've got the written change plan in action. We know what the supports are. We got all that stuff. Now the action stage to me is really just a process of substitution or what they call countering. All you're doing is replacing old unhealthy habits with newer, healthier ones. Um, where's the energy going to go? exercise, the relaxation, and then how do we replace, how do we use affirmations to replace the negative thinking? You're going to fail. You've tried this a hundred times before and it's never worked. How do we flip those into affirmations to help keep that person going and keep the positive thinking going as opposed to this uh, stinking thinking? Maintenance. One of the biggest suggestions that I would make here is don't fix what ain't broke. If a person has managed to do a year changing something successfully, don't pull out the supports. Don't change the plan. Keep it going. If anything, what's the next area of change? Uh, you notice that magical phenomenon where you clean one room in your house and then all the other rooms in the house immediately look worse because now that one room is clean. This is sort of the plan. Let, now, instead of changing anything that's going on with that clean room, let's, let's take this act to these other rooms and, and get all of this done. Very important piece is watching for slips. Um, making sure that um, if there's a, you know, just because somebody had that one cigarette or that one cheat meal or whatever, it isn't over. Learn from it. What's the thing that actually helped make get you this far in the game? Uh, don't disengage from supports, as we mentioned. And then this last one is the 12th step. Help someone else with the same issue. One of the best ways to keep, uh, they, in AA, they call it keeping your recovery green, but when you've made the change for a while, sometimes you forget how bad it was. But if you see people that are coming in at that place where you were when you started, it's a really powerful reminder. So the relapse stage. First of all, we plan for the relapse stage in advance. Few people change the first time out. Be, relapse should be expected. Don't be surprised. In fact, I think it's a genius move when you're the helper to say, look, I'm expecting this. Uh, to go sideways at least once. This is a big change you're making, and this is how we're going to learn. The beauty of this is if they get it right the first time, you're a genius, and they'll forget that you said that. But then when it comes around again, you can say, well, we expected that, so let's plan for that. Let's, you know, we already knew this was going to happen, so now let's work with that. I love to say these following two things. Feel free to steal them. One, this is a chance to improve the change plan. As we mentioned before, bl blame the change plan, not the person. The other one I love to ask is what else do you need to give up? This one is particularly uh, poignant with people with addictions, because not only are we asking them to give up their addiction, very often we're asking them to give up their friends too. That's a challenge. So I want to be clean, but I want to hang out with my friends who use, and that, that usually does not go well. Uh, another piece of this is the myth of willpower. Uh, willpower doesn't exist. It's a construct that we've made up. Unfortunately, it's not extraordinarily helpful. 
Uh, and it has no location in the brain. There is no willpower spot in the brain. They can't find it. So when you're successful, we say, well, I had willpower. If someone else is successful, they had willpower. And if you fail, I have no willpower. It doesn't work that way. Change is this sort of dynamic, almost tectonic plate process of pressure in both directions. And as the, as the resistance to change dissolves, change moves forward, or as circumstances change, it moves forward. It's a dynamic process. A lapse is not a relapse, a slip is not a fall, as we said before. Just because there's been a slip doesn't mean that the plan's over. Distress precedes relapse. Uh, AA has a great saying, uh, it's called HALT, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. Uh, and that usually is that relapse, and I mean symptom relapse or addiction relapse, whichever, relapse in the old behavior, uh, is usually preceded by being hungry, angry, lonely, tired. That's HALT. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. I've also heard of HALT BS, which is hungry, angry, lonely, tired, bored, and stressed. They belong, right? So HALT BS, I'm a big fan. Uh, where did the plan not help you? And the biggest, I think the biggest task in the relapse stage is no shaming and no blaming. This is part of the course. This is just how it happens. This is how change happens. You learn, you, you rode a bike, you fell a bunch of times before you figured out how to do it. When you were learning how to catch, somebody bounced the ball off your head or your chest a bunch of times before you finally got the knack of it. And failing forward is how we learn. So quick quiz. I want you to take a look at the, uh, you know, if you want to, you can think about the stages that we just talked about. Pre-contemplation, I don't have a problem. Contemplation, I have a problem, but I don't know what to do about it. Preparation is about the plan. Action, putting that plan into action. Maintenance, when it gets easier. And then relapse, which is, I messed up and. So let's take a look at Larry. Larry is angry that he's in the hospital, blames his family for sending him here, which they've done a number of times before. He doesn't want to go to any groups and will only take meds if he has to while he's here. He's not open to talking about his history of legal problems and psychiatric hospitalizations. What stage of change do you think Larry is in? I'll take a minute where, take a minute for you to think about it. Well, actually, Larry's pretty easy, right? So let's let's go through my little template for how we do assessing stage of change. Does Larry feel he has a problem in this example with having mental illness? The answer is a pretty clear no. So if the answer to that is no, he does not feel he has a problem. Larry is in pre-contemplation about mental illness. And Larry's pretty textbook. He's an easy one, actually. So let's move on to Cecilia. She's been in the hospital for the past several months. In the last month, she's begun coming to groups, sharing about her illness. She told her husband to have all the alcohol out of the house. She's going to be doing 90 meetings in 90 days after release. She's got a notebook and is doing 12-step work in it. All right, Cecilia is a little more complicated than Larry. Let's go through the question process. Does Cecilia feel that she has a problem with alcohol? All right, sounds like yes. So we can rule out pre-contemplation. So contemplation, she has a problem, but does she know what to do about it? Well, sounds like there's a kind of plan in, in progress here. Actually, it the, the, the sounds like there's quite a bit of a plan. So we can rule out contemplation because there are some steps being taken here. So preparation. So we have a, a we do, you know, if we have a written change plan that she is following. And this is where it gets a little muddy. It does sound like there's a plan. It sounds like it's in some state of progress. So to me, that would put Cecilia in preparation. She has taken some preparatory steps, getting the, the pre-action steps, but we're not fully there yet. I think by the time she gets discharged, that's when the plan gets going. So Cecilia has elements of contemplation, but she also uh, has, I would say she's primarily in the preparatory stage. So let's move on to Bruce. Bruce has been a patient several times. Now he's asking questions about bipolar disorder, which he's never done before. He's always denied having a mental illness, but is now asking questions and expresses being tired of coming in and out of the hospital, moving all the time. All right, so let's talk about Bruce. Does Bruce feel that he has a problem, in this case with bipolar disorder? Well, it sounds like if you'd asked a while ago, he would have been a no, and Bruce would have been in pre-contemplation. But now he's asking questions. So, but do we have a plan? Is he preparing to make any changes? We're not quite that far yet. 
So Bruce sounds like he's in contemplation and it sounds like he's new to contemplation. Not everybody fits in the stages as neat and cleanly as Larry did. Cecilia was a little, a little murky as well. Bruce is what we would call a new person in contemplation. And he may not stay here. He may dart back out again. If he gets an answer he doesn't like, he might be out the door. Or maybe this is a gateway to him being able to, you know, accept the diagnosis and treatment. All right, so let's move on to Ed. Ed has been in the hospital, being treated for schizophrenia. It states that he has schizophrenia and needs treatment for this here and on the outside. He states that smoking PCP got him in here, and he never wants to do that again. He's interested in stopping cigarettes, but tell you he's, he enjoys pot and will begin using that daily after he's released. Okay, Ed is complicated. Uh, Ed actually resembles our clients much better. He's got multiple problems, which is what most of our clients have. So this is one of those arguments why Ed cannot be a pre-contemplator or a contemplator, because he's got multiple things going on and he's not in a different place with all of them. So let's break Ed down by problem. So problem number one is schizophrenia. So if we ask Ed, do you have schizophrenia? It sounds like the answer is yes, so we can roll out pre-contemplation. Um, how are we regarding a plan? Well, he needs treatment for this here and on the outside. So he sounds agreeable. So it sounds like we're ready to start preparation with him. It sounds like we're ready to bounce something off him and see if he's uh, ready to move with it. So I'll say preparation on him. We're right in between contemplation and, and preparation. He states that smoking PCP got him in here and he never wants to do that again. Does he have a problem with PCP? Yes, so we can rule out pre-contemplation. Is there a plan? Never wanting to do that isn't a plan, it's a wish. So we're contemplation regarding a PCP. He is interested in stopping cigarettes. Okay, that sounds like the PCP situation again. He acknowledges that it's a problem, but there's no plan, he's interested. So, okay, so we're in contemplation. Maybe we got to put a plan uh, by him on that one as well. Tells you he enjoys pot and will begin using that daily after he's released. Is there a problem? The answer is no. So it's pre-contemplation. So we've got preparation for schizophrenia. We've got contemplation for PCP and for cigarettes and pre-contemplation for pot. What do we do first? And the answer is, let's start with getting him set up with the treatment for schizophrenia. And oh, while we're at it, let's just ask if he's interested in any sort of addiction treatment as well, maybe for the PCP, you know, well, let's work on some of that. And we'll see if we address some of those other things. So Ed is a much better example of what we may actually be seeing and this whole process. So break the person into their component list of problems, see what, where, what stage they are at for each of those problems, and then pick the one or ones that they're furthest along on, and then let's go from there. So we're gonna shift gears now. We're moving over from stages of change into motivational interviewing. Now, motivational interviewing, when you do the official like full training, it's like three days and it covers all of these areas, spirit, method, oars, all of these. We're gonna be touching on primarily the first five of these, uh, just to give you a general idea. And then I'll talk at the end about resources where if you wanna go further with this, so part of the purpose of motivational interviewing is that people don't always act in their best interests. You think having a heart attack would be enough to get someone to change their habits. You think a drunk driving crash would be enough to stop someone from drinking. Uh, you would think amputations would be enough to get someone to watch and take better care of their sugar. You'd think getting locked up once would be all the warning you would need. Never want to get locked up again, whether it's a prison or a state psychiatric hospital, but it doesn't work that way. Um, people cycle through those issues all, all the time. And going back to what we were just talking about, it's because they are in some level of pre-contemplation or contemplation about what their problem is. And they're stuck they're, and they're not moving forward. You've already heard me say that resistance is usually ambivalence. Part of the person wants to change, part of the person doesn't want to change. And then we create the resistance by shooting past where they are in the change process. So you're not going to hear me use the word resistance too much, not as a resistant client or a resistant person. It'll be more about the idea of resistance being something we generate by pushing the client too hard. Ambivalence is the word you'll hear more often than resistance. Now, ambivalence is a two-stage thing in motivational interviewing. At first, we build the ambivalence, and then we diminish the ambivalence through action. We'll talk about how that works. 
One of the other pieces about motivational interviewing, it's been very critical from, from my own practice is something called the double bind. And that is if someone is someone who is stuck in a change process, they really feel they're in a position where they're damned if they do and damned if they don't. So they're not going to move forward. If you have two bad choices, you're not in a hurry to choose one of those bad choices. The problem is that we as helpers want to jump right in and fix everything right off the bat. And we don't want to do that. We need to listen more and fix less. People don't want to be fixed. They want to be heard. That's a, a, a misquote of Bill Miller. Uh, so until we are in the situation where we've heard enough about the problem, where, where we fully understand why they're stuck and say, geez, I, I could see I might be stuck in that same situation. Now we're ready to help. The problem is we shortcut that process all the time. And the writing reflex is just this desire to fix everything. The universe and we are constantly trying to fix these things. And so people are in a position of summoning all these, all this resistance against that. So what I, I put up here on this uh, script, now when we do this training live, there's a series of exercises and you'll see some of these exercises as we go. We're not gonna do them on this video, but if we ever do, the, do this in person, uh, I welcome you, uh, you to participate in these exercises. This is a quick little script. So take a look at these questions in blue here. And this is a quick and dirty MI script. So if someone was talking about making a change, you'd ask the following questions. Why do you wanna make this change? How would you go about it in order to succeed? What are the three best reasons to do it? How important is it for you to make this change? And what do you think you'll do? You hear how open these are? There's no advice, there's no judgment, there's no direction on the part of the, you know, the practitioner. It's just, it, it's coming from the principle that the person is trying to work out their own problem and we are helping them to do that instead of taking over the process and making it in our, in our own image. So I just wanted to keep these open-ended questions there. Try this with someone. If you get a chance, write these down and try these with someone or have them do it with you and see how this works because it takes you, the practitioner, out of the picture and you're more of a mirror for that person and that will help. So a continuum of styles. We talked a little bit before about how motivational interviewing is much more about the guiding. It's much more the middle of the road, not being out in front directing and not being behind and following. Now, it doesn't mean that you need to change your style. Uh, I'm sure you fall somewhere on this continuum between, uh, I make this joke in the training that I call the, the directive people my drill sergeants and my followers I call my teddy bears. And it's funny in group to see people volunteer each other. Everybody points at the drill sergeants. Uh, and everybody seems to know who they are. I'm less concerned about that. My goal is that your approach, whatever it is, whether it's predominantly directing or predominantly following, and I'm sure you move a little bit depending on the situation. My concern is that you can work both sides. If you tend to be more directive, can you dial it back and be more following and, and supportive? If you're more of the touchy-feely teddy bear type, is there a time where you can be directive? So, and to me, the goal of motivational interviewing is to help you with the people that you've struggled with. I know there's certain types of situations and certain types of clients that you struggle with. And my sincerest hope from this is it gives you a couple extra tools in your, in your toolkit to be able to work with those problematic situations. Because what happens is we come at those situations the same way and we get the same result. I'm hoping to teach you a different way to come at them and you will get a different result. What that result is remains to be seen. So motivational interviewing involves a change in role. So some fundamental assumptions here. One, you can't make change happen. There is no perfect thing to say or perfect thing to do that's gonna, respond, that's gonna result in a spontaneous cure. You don't have to come up with all the answers. You may not have the best ones. And if the person isn't ready to hear it, even if you did have the best answer, they're still not gonna hear it. We know this is true. You have movies that you've seen a thousand times, books that you've read a thousand times, and then all of a sudden something will jump out at you that's been there the whole time. No one changed your movie, no one changed your book. You were just ready to see and hear this thing. And this is how our clients work as well. The metaphor that they use for motivational interviewing is dancing instead of wrestling. Wrestling is force on force, as we talked about this change process. Dancing is two people moving together. Uh, it is graceful. My belief is if you're working with a client in an individual or a group setting, and by the time you're done, you're exhausted, that means you're working too hard. That means you are being the change agent and the other person is, is fighting you on it. 
So as far as a definition for motivational interviewing goes, it's a collaborative conversation style. The goal is to strengthen a person's motivation and commitment to change. We do that primarily by just talking to someone. And then during the, the talking part, we find out what their strengths and their goals are. And then we find out what the barriers are and what's tripped them up in the past. And then we help guide them through those barriers to be able to make the change happen. Motivational interviewing is not just being nice, although it, part of it is being nice, but it's not it by itself. It's not being a cheerleader. You're not a motivational speaker. We're not going to do motivational interviewing and then have you walk across hot coals or anything like that. Motivational interviewing is not stages of change, but they do work very well together. Uh, motivational interviewing is not an absence of assessment or feedback. Uh, and it's not tricking people into changing. It's that one of the biggest knocks that I hear about it in the psychiatric hospitals, well, you know, we're letting them talk and we're letting them direct and all that kind of stuff. And like, well, you know, not necessarily. It's much, it's being less overtly directive for sure, but it's also not creating resistance. So there's a spirit of uh, motivational interviewing that involves partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evocation. Uh, and I think you, you know what all of these things are. Uh, I just included a couple quotes here to give you an idea of, of what they look like in an MI framework. I love this uh, quote from Dr. Amador. Why would anyone want to listen to you if you had not first listened to them? It's a really good question. First, we have to listen. And I know we're all working under time deadlines and uh, there's pressures to get things done, but there's no substitute for listening and there's no substitute for developing the relationship. If the relationship isn't there, change is not going to happen. Motivational interviewing is done with someone, not for them, not to them. Acceptance. Uh, you guys know what acceptance is. We accept the person as they are. It's not conditional. I'm still going to be here on the other side. Even if you make decisions I don't agree with, I'm still going to be here for you. This is that, you know, unconditional positive regard for, you know, the, the Regerian types in, in the audience here. We appreciate and acknowledge and accept the person for who they are. And we want them to become actually more who they are. Compassion. This is probably my favorite quote. Uh, I'm not interested in picking up crumbs of compassion thrown from the table of someone who considers himself my master. I want my full menu of rights. Compassion, feeling with or suffering with. That means you need to be on the same level. It can't be condescending. It can't be pity. You know that old, uh, that old line about sympathy and empathy? You know, empathy is with, sympathy is sort of down to. So compassion is a process. I don't want to go too deeply into this. This is a whole other presentation all its own. But part of it is we know about the suffering of others by knowing about our own suffering. Uh, we don't know exactly what the person's sadness feels like, what their joy feels like, what their anxiety feels like. But we know what joy, sadness, and anxiety feel like. Uh, we have to have, be in touch with our own feelings to be able to help with the feelings of others. If we are blocking our own feelings and our own emotion for whatever reason, um, then we have that much trouble reaching out to someone else. And from that empathy, from that feeling, that pain of others as my own comes the compassionate act, the compassionate behavior, the helping behavior, uh, whether that helping behavior is even just listening and supporting someone. Uh, evocation, I love this. Uh, this is what I basically say to people when they come to my private practice. Uh, Bill Miller's version is you have what you need and together we will find it. Uh, my version is when clients first come in, you know, we're trying to elicit, you know, some hope. Uh, I will always say the bad news is you brought all your problems in with you. The good news is you brought all the solutions in too. Our job is to get them together. And a neat part about motivational interviewing, it's less about teaching than eliciting, drawing out like water from a well. I think that's another great metaphor. So motivational interviewing also has a method. Uh, engagement is all about establishing that therapeutic relationship, that working alliance right at the beginning. We have to do that before we jump to these later stages. I worked in an emergency room for 20 years, in a hurry all the time. Can't cheat this part. Then we go to focus. Why are you here? And again, we're not just focusing on what's your problem and what's wrong with you, but also their goals. What do you want? What do you want to accomplish? What do you want to achieve? Goals versus deficit. Then evoking, getting the story in their words. We will, of course, have our own interpretation, our own feeling about what's going on, but get it in their words. Then and only then 
let's start to put the plan together. And you can see here in these first three steps where we assess the stages of change before we get to planning. What problems do they have they want to work on and which are they furthest along on so that we can address, start to address that one and put the plan together for that one. So just some things to ask about in each of these stages. Am I comfortable? Does the other person appear comfortable? Do I understand their side? Is this setting helping or hurting? And I love this question. Are we dancing or am I kind of forcing the lead here? When we get to the focusing stage, what goals do they have? Are my goals for them similar, if not the exact same or synonymous with their goals for them? Are we both headed in the same direction? Are we dancing or are we wrestling? When we get to the evocation, what are the person's reason for change? What are the person's reason for staying the same, by the way? What is the barrier? Where's the double bind? Because again, if we don't have that double bind where I understand why they're stuck, I get it then we're not ready to make the change happen. Am I pushing too hard? Am I being the person who's arguing for change? Because if I'm arguing for change, then that person's job is to argue to stay the same. And then it turns into a game of one-on-one. -on -one. When we get to the planning stage, what's the next step? What will help them move forward? Am I offering unsolicited advice? And we're gonna talk about advice quite a bit. In motivational interviewing, our main mission is to avoid giving advice wherever possible. Am I leading? Am I following or am I guiding? So that covers the spirit and the method. Now we're gonna be moving on to uh, the tools or the core skills of motivational interviewing, which are known as ORs. Open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. So closed-ended questions are basically yes or no questions or questions that can be answered with a very short answer, like your address, your date of birth, et cetera, et cetera. So the good news is their job is to get a specific piece of information. The bad news is they limit the information that you get back. They also don't help build relationship. So open-ended questions open the door, encourage a person to talk, and they give a room for a broad, broad range of responses. Just to give you an example, I worked in an emergency room and part of our assessment was this uh, substance abuse evaluation. And it was brutal. It was a bunch of yes or no questions. Uh, are you currently drinking alcohol? Have you drunk alcohol in the past? Have you ever been in inpatient treatment for alcoholism? Do you have a history of alcoholism in your family? And then you would ask all those same questions for alcohol, amphetamines, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, cannabinoids, I mean, all the way down the line. It was brutal. It was probably between 50 and 70 yes or no questions. So I'm going through these questions and it feels like a tennis match. We're just going back and forth and I get to the end and I get ready to move on to the next subject. And the client said, oh, I used to sniff gas. I went, what? I said, well, I used to sniff gas. He said, but that wasn't on one of your questions. And it was then that I realized that my questions were pretty bad and that my assessment was pretty awful. Um, so I decided after this, after some experimentation, that I was going to do open-ended questions. So it would turn into, tell me about your history of addiction. You know, have you ever had a problem with addiction? What did that look like? Can you tell me about that? So I would lead with the open-ended questions and then we would have a conversation about it. And then I would go back and fill in the holes with closed-ended questions. So let them tell me the story, let them tell me the narrative. And at the end I would say, all right, so when was the last time you were in rehab? That's a closed-ended question, but I'm looking for a specific piece of information. Or, or did you have a fan, is there a family history of that? So lead with the open and then do the potholes with the closed-ended uh, closed questions would be my recommendation. So let's do a little test here. Uh, are these open or closed-ended questions? What, and, and how you tell is, could you answer them yes or no or with a, a very tiny specific answer? So what would you like from treatment, open or closed? That's open. There's a range of responses. Was your family religious? Okay, we can answer that yes or no, so that's closed. What do you like about drinking? Is that open or closed? Open, wide open answer. If you were to quit, how would you do it? Open or closed? And that's also open. Is this an open-ended question? This is in fact a trick question. Uh, the correct answers are either closed or no. Just making sure you're listening, making sure you're out there. You know. 
So some guidelines with questions is we want to ask as few questions as possible. By doing open-ended questions, we ask less questions. So it's less of an interrogation and more of a conversation. And again, we're trying to build these things open. Now, if you are really going to get deep into motivational interviewing, if you like what you're hearing and you're serious about this, at some point down the road, you will get into where you will actually tape sessions and keep count. And you'll keep count of how many closed-ended questions, open-ended questions, reflections, which we'll get into. Uh, they get pretty hardcore about it. But there's a reason for that. It's knowing which tools you're using. You might not even realize right now how many open or closed-ended questions you, you ask when you're interviewing somebody. And I would ask you the next time that you sit down with somebody is to keep track of that. How many are closed-ended? How many of those closed-ended could become open-ended and may actually function better? So that might be a takeaway point for you to consider going forward. Or look at the paperwork. If you intake or do assessments on people, look at them. Are they open-ended or are they closed-ended? And how could you change it to make it more open-ended and capture more information? So this is another one of those exercises. And basically the purpose of this is to see, we actually can get pretty far with closed-ended questions. So the person one says, one thing I like about myself is that I am. The person answers back with only closed-ended questions. So do you mean that you blank? So let me just provide an example. Uh, so if I was going to say one thing I like about myself is that I am funny. Now, no sarcastic answers yet. We'll get to that in a minute. So using closed-ended questions. So do you mean that you? So do you mean that you like to tell jokes? Yes. Uh, do you mean that you think that you're funny? Okay, yes. <laughs> so the idea is just to ask questions that can be answered with yes or no. And we can go pretty far with those, but at the same time, it's frustrating and limited. Uh, again, I invite you the opportunity to be able to do this training in person and we can actually do these exercises. So moving on to affirmations. Affirmations is just praise. It's just praise. It's just a compliment. Um, the patients, the clients that we work with don't get enough compliments. You, probably as staff, don't get enough compliments. Praise, affirmations, compliments are the quickest way to build a relationship, particularly at the beginning. Now, the only trick of this is, do we have any sarcastic people out there? Sure we do. Affirmations can't be backhanded. Can't be backhanded praise. It's gotta be, it's gotta be legit. And my, it might be difficult to be able to find something to praise, but no, no change. If someone's usually 10 minutes late to group and they're five minutes late to group, you can praise them for getting there earlier and you know they're making an effort to get there. Uh, you can compliment that they're a survivor. They've gone through a lot in their life. I love complimenting people for their participation in group. To me, it increases their participation in the next group. Anything that I see can be praiseworthy. Next up is reflections. And reflections is actually probably the most difficult tool of motivational interviewing uh, to capture. So we're gonna spend a little bit more time on it. There's also additional material on this that I encourage you to look up and work with because it's worth it. It's definitely worth it, but it takes practice. And it's a little more complicated than we can just get into in a couple of slides here, but we just want to sort of break the ice here. So right here, we have where three places where communication goes wrong. So we have a speaker on the left and a listener on the right. So the speaker has what they want to say, what they do say, what the listener hears, and then the interpretation of what they've heard. So you see these three numbers here. These are our three, uh, three traps. So trap number one is when the speaker knows what they want to say, but then they say something and the words just aren't right. This happens to me every day, and I'm guessing you can probably relate to it as well. You know what you want to say, but then the words come out and you're like, can I do that again? That was completely wrong. So that's the first one. The second one is when the listener doesn't hear the words accurately. I don't know if you've ever done that. Uh, I think they call it a telephone exercise where you whisper something into someone's ear, then they whisper it once to the next person and then all the way around the room. By the time it gets to the far end of the room, the meaning is completely destroyed. That's a whole bunch of number two issues on top of each other. If a person doesn't hear you properly, the meaning is going to get lost. And then number three is when the words mean something different to the listener than they do to the speaker. Uh, those of you who have uh, teenage kids, I'm sure that you are familiar with this because the meaning of words changes over time. Um, bad has been good and bad at different times. The word crazy has morphed quite a bit. You can have a crazy party. Does that mean it was a good thing or a bad thing? 
Uh, the word lit has changed quite a bit <laughs> over time. So some of these changes are generationally. Some words mean different things to different groups of people. Uh, an example that, uh, that I thought was hilarious is I was watching um, a show. There was a former NBA player who's now a commentator who was talking about he and his friend were in a car and they, were, they made a wrong turn. And they were driving through a really rough neighborhood and a car pulled up alongside and a person held a gun out the window, pointed it at them. So the NBA player stomps on the gas, takes off, hears shots fired, looks over at his friend and his friend has been hit. He's taken a couple of bullets. And so he gets on, he's still driving, trying to get away from the situation, gets on the phone, calls 911, gets on the operator. And he, uh, now obviously he's very upset. He's just been involved in a shooting. His friend is hit and hurt, heading down the road. And he says, somebody shot my dog. Somebody shot my dog. So the 911 operator gave them directions to the nearest veterinary hospital. She had clearly heard him say that his dog had been shot. Now, we're not talking about his dog. We're talking about his friend. But the word had a different meaning for those two people. Now, fortunately, the people hospital was located next to the veterinary hospital, so the directions were still good. But you could see how that one would go really badly by misinterpreting uh, the meaning. So the purpose of a reflection is to close this loop to see if any of these three traps have been hit. So the reflection closes it off because the purpose of a reflection is to let the speaker know that you heard them and that you understand, you know, that you got their meaning. So reflections are different from questions and they're different because they don't start with question words. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And they don't have that uplift at the end. You know, what time are we finished today? There's usually that upward inflection. In a statement, we're finished at four o'clock. That's level. So reflections, as we'll talk about, come into two different types of groups. There are simple reflections where you're just giving back what you've gotten. And then there's complex reflections, which allow you to pick and choose what part of what a person said you pay attention to. And also to make a guess about what you think they mean. So it's better than a question because you're going in the same direction they're going, and then you can take a step out ahead and see if it's right or if it isn't. Because again, people want you to hear them. They want to be understood. They don't want to be fixed. So if you get it wrong, the person will correct you because they want you to get it. It doesn't do them any good for you not to understand what they're talking about. So as we talked about, the reflections uh, can introduce a hypothesis. So on one level, it's just understanding, but then you have that higher level. We'll talk about that. Uh, in more detail. So also, reflections don't start with question words. So if you look here over these red X's, so a question might mean, do you mean that you, like our last exercise, will you cut all those out? So in a reflection, you say as if you knew it were true, and then let them tell you if you're right or wrong. There's no penalty for missing because they want you to get it. That's the whole point of a conversation. So these are some starters for me. When we do the exercises, I suggest that people start with these reflections. These may not work coming out of your mouth. These may not work for the clients or type of clients you work with. This is just meant to be a starting off point. You will come up with your own. Uh, you know, sounds like is the gold standard. Sounds like dot, dot, dot. Um, but so these may not work for everybody in all situations, but they're a nice place to start with. And then ultimately you'll, you'll find your own as well. So as we mentioned before, there's simple reflections and complex reflections. So these are the simple reflections. The simplest form of, of reflection is called repetition or parroting. Parroting is just saying back to the person exactly what they said to you. No interpretation, no changes. Now, as you imagine, you can't go through a whole 45 minute session doing just this. Otherwise that person will feel like they're, you know, talking into a cave or into a valley and they're just hearing an echo uh, back. But for the purpose of letting them know that you heard what they said, if you give it back to them verbatim, there's no doubt in their mind that they heard you. This is great with couples, by the way. Uh, there are some couples that have been together so long that they don't even listen to each other anymore and they automatically change in color what the other person said. So the idea of being able to give it back exactly so. I'll give you a great example from a couple I was working with. So the wife says to the husband, I wish you would help me out more around the house. The husband said, she just said, I don't do anything around the house. Well, wait a minute, let's, let's try that again. The wife says, I want you to help, I, I would like it if you help me more around the house. Do you know it took three sessions before the husband actually got it right? 
and said, all right, you said uh, you want me to help out more around the house. It took three sessions to get there. Then, of course, the punchline is we did the same thing in reverse and it took the wife three sessions to get it too. So it was, it was, they just weren't listening. So that's the benefit of this sort of parroting or, or repetition. Now, a rephrase is when you get to change it a little bit. You get to tweak it just a little bit, but in your own words. So that, that gives you the opportunity to throw this hypothesis in there a little bit and see if what you're thinking is right or wrong. And it also gives the person a chance to hear what they said back. You know, when they said it to you, now you get to give it back and they get to think about how that sounds. I love working with clients where they say, oh, well, I don't like the way you said that. And they'll say, well, what did I do? What did I say that was wrong? And I said, no, you said it right. I just don't like it when you say it. And that's, and that's pretty insightful. So for example, so uh, take an example of a rephrase. If someone says, I'm really looking forward to retiring, uh, I can hardly wait to be out of this place, which is a pretty typical, I work for the state. So that's one that comes up in every, uh, in every training. So if I say back, oh yeah, it's gonna be great for you to not have to wake up early anymore. All right, so I kind of, I took something that they said and I changed it and I brought it back to them. And they might say, well, no, it's not that. It's just, I wanna have control of my own schedule. I wanna dictate what I do during the day and not have to you know, be here and go where I'm told to go. So even though my rephrase was wrong, they corrected me. And no points lost for, for being wrong because I'm trying to get it. So now we get into complex reflections. And again, I think we're gonna need to spend more detailed time on this. But this is where we get into that part where you listen to what the person said and then decide based on what they said, what direction you want to go in. What part of what they said do you want to call attention to? So let me give you a scenario. So say, let's, let's work with that retirement one a little bit more. Um, so someone says, you know what, I'm really looking forward to retiring. I've put in 30 plus years here and um, you know, I've had my day structured and I've been told what to do and where to go for a long time. And I'm really just looking forward to, to being done with that. So that's the scenario that we're gonna go through these uh, complex reflections on. So reflecting content means that we're just taking the facts of what they said. So you're planning your retirement. There's no emotion in it. You just sort of sent back the sum total of what they were saying to you. You can also reflect feeling. You're excited about retiring. There's no content there. You're just grabbing the emotion and running with it. Reflecting meaning means you take part of the content and part of the feeling and you try to combine them or go to a deeper level with it. My favorite reflection for people talking about retirement is freedom. And then when you do that reflection, then they're going to give you more about that. And chances are, if you reflect the content or the feeling, that's the direction they're going to go. So if you talk about the content, they might talk more about the content. If you reflect the feeling, they might talk more about the feeling. If you talk, if you get the meaning, you might go to a whole deeper level about what the meaning of retirement is for them. So a couple additional types of complex reflections. One is called double-sided. Now you remember when we were talking about the double bind, being able to appreciate both sides of the situation? This is where that is. I love double-sided reflections. You make the argument for the prosecution and for the defense in the same sense. So the double-sided reflection for our vignette here is, so I hear that you're excited about retiring, but you're not sure what you're going to do with your free time. See how we caught both sides of that? I'm excited, I'm psyched, but at the same time, I'm afraid. It's a great double-sided reflection. Another one I, he I heard that's pretty classic is uh, where someone said, okay, so I hear that you, you're telling me that you're not an alcoholic, but uh, that you have seven DWIs. That's a great double-sided reflection. And you just leave it there. You leave it there for the client to try to interpret the discrepancy between those two things. The last type of reflection here uh, is amplified reflection, and that is being retired is the best thing that ever happened to you. So amplified reflection is when you deliberately take something too far. So again, picking on you guys who have teenage kids out there, who of you have had your kids say that the worst thing ever just happened to them? The worst thing ever. The last two worst things ever that I heard in the training, one involved frizzy hair and the other one involved the wrong person asking someone out to a dance probably not the worst things ever. So the amplified reflection for that would be, you know what, that absolutely is the worst thing ever. You know, there are people in the hospital right now that would, would love to be, you know, they're glad they're where they are instead of where you are right now. This really is the worst thing that's ever happened to anybody. 
This one you kind of have to pick your spots with, but there's a part where it makes people think. If they're coming from a place of, of really charged emotion, you can make them think about it. Uh, an example of an amplified reflection that worked for me is we had a very destructive person in our hospital. This person did a lot of damage. And I had him in group. One day I walk onto the unit, he comes running down the hall at me full speed. And I was a little concerned for my safety and a little concerned that he was trying to escape the unit. Get the door shut and locked behind him. He walks up, he says, Mr. Ken, Mr. Ken, Mr. Ken, I'm so pissed off, I can't stand it. And he says, I'm gonna throw a chair through a window and he's talking about all the stuff he's gonna do. I had just enough presence of mind to be able to say to him, this is the most angry you've ever been in your life. And he stopped for a second and he went, nah, I've been a lot more angry than this. Okay, good, all right, good. We pulled him out of that place of being angry. I was actually just afraid to ask him what happened because I thought that would escalate him. But by doing this process of, this is the angriest you've ever been in your entire life, betting on the fact that it wasn't, that actually got him to think about it and it slowed him down a little bit. Then we found out what the heck was going on. So the exercise for this, again, we can do this one in person how I hope things will be different in my life five years from now. And we respond only with reflective statements. So if a person says, I'm looking forward to being uh, retired in seven years, you have those, all those reflections that we were just talking about uh, to send back at him. So you can either repeat back exactly what the person said, or I invite you to take a guess about what the person's meaning was and go in a direction with it. So if someone says they're thinking about retiring, and you say, um, you know what? Uh, you're really looking forward to getting out of this state and moving and relocating. Okay, well, you just kind of came up with that on your own. You might be right. And if you're right, they'll be thinking about it. And if you're wrong, they'll tell you differently. Or maybe you've planted the seed in their mind and that's something they're gonna think about. So either way, there's no way to lose with those. Because if you're right, you're right. And if they're wrong, they'll redirect you. So the last of the ors is called the summaries. And the, the thing about the summary is, and I, I think this can be very powerful, uh, if you guys have been to a, a restaurant before where you've had a waiter or waitress take the order for like six, eight, ten people and not write any of it down, first of all, that's a major skill. That's definitely 20% plus. The other part of it is, I also love it when they recite the order to you before you leave. So they go and they give you the whole order of everything that you're getting. I love that because it gives you the opportunity to change something if you've changed your mind, or if there's a mistake, you get to catch it before it goes back to the kitchen. So I'm a huge fan. And this is basically the same, the clinical version of that. So a summary, you get a chance to take everything that that person said to you and send it back to them for a couple different purposes. We have collecting summaries, linking summaries, and transitional summaries. So collecting summary is so you're just getting the whole thing. I want to make sure I got all that you're telling me. Boom, here it is. A linking summary gives you a chance to take all that they're saying now, but bring in something that they said before, which is very powerful, very powerful. If you bring in stuff that someone has said to you in previous sessions, it shows to them that you've been listening to them all along. And maybe by connecting that thing that they said before to where they are now, there might be something there. So collecting, linking, and transitioning. If a person is kind of going in a direction that you don't feel is necessarily in the direction of change or helpful, or if they're just kind of going on a tangent, this is a great opportunity to put the brakes on somebody and say, hold on and hold on and hold on. You've given me a lot of stuff here and I want to make sure I've got it. And then you give it all back to them. And at the end you go, did I get it? Did I get it right? Did I miss anything? And then that gives you a chance to move on and, and either end the conversation and get away from the situation or to transition it to some place that might be more helpful. In my job in the emergency room, we would do uh, emergency evaluations, which would be about a 45 minute interview with somebody. And so before I got to the end, then I'd have to run it by my supervisor and the doctor, et cetera. And I would always say right at the end, all right, I wanna make sure I got everything. And I would give it back to them. And at the end I would say, did I miss anything? And I noticed that my resp the response I would get from the clients was more nonverbal than verbal. If I got it right, the person would sit back and take a breath. They visibly relaxed at the fact that they'd been heard. If there was anything missing or wrong, they would be up on the balls of their feet waiting for me to finish so that they could jump in and, and add whatever was, you know, or fix whatever was wrong. So the nonverbal will tell you if you got it. And again, you want to ask that person, did I get it? Did I miss anything? Critical. It's like 
summaries are almost like big double reflections, but it's that big grand finale one at the end. So same deal here, uh, another exercise. Uh, there's something called an OR sheet, which uh, you can track down through motivational interviewing materials, or you can reach out to me and get it from me. Uh, and the OR sheet is basically a sheet where you track what you say back to someone. So someone would say to you something that they wanna change, need to change, should change, but haven't changed yet. And then you would have a sheet where you would have a quadrant for open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and then a summary at the end. And you can keep track of all of your responses to see how you did and if you caught all the ORs. A suggestion I would give you is when you're interviewing someone next, I would write ORs in the little margin of your notes just so you remember. I mean, I'm not saying you got to write down and keep count every time you did an open-ended question or a reflection, although you could do that. Uh, but I wrote ORs on my notes for the next several years just to make sure I did them so I wouldn't forget. I wouldn't forget the summary, wouldn't forget to work an affirmation in there so that I would get all the ORs in there. And again, when you're doing this interview, in fact, I would, I would actually ask you, the next time that you speak with someone, either professionally or maybe even personally, someone in your family, if you feel like you're gonna have the same discussion with them that you've always had, just do ORs. Instead of doing what you'd always do, do open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. I guarantee you will get something back different than what you've been getting. Because you know how this works. If you're doing this with family, you guys have had the same discussion over and over again, the same argument over and over again. But I guarantee if you abandon the advice and the things that you always say, just do the oars and see what happens. I did this with my wife. We had an hour long conversation when I got back from my big motivational interview and training. She was having a lot of difficulties where she was working at the time. So she, for an hour, she was telling me about what was going on. And instead of me giving advice, telling her what I think I should do, I just asked open-ended questions. I gave her affirmations. I don't know how you even do the job with all of the complications that are going on. You know, can you tell me more about that? I reflected things back to her. Sounds like it's really difficult to focus on the kids with all this drama going on. And then when we were coming back to the home stretch, I gave her the summary. And when I got to the end, I said, you know, did I get it? Did I get it right? She said, yeah, you did. She said, is this that stuff that you were learning, that motivational interviewing stuff? And I said, yeah, it is. But then she said something that she had never said to me before after one of our discussions. She said, thank you. Now, the reality of the situation was she was trying to fix this situation and my efforts to make suggestions were only muddying the water. In the end, she did what she needed to do and she ended up resolving it. And I did more good by doing the oars with her than by trying to direct it. So one of the last subjects we're going to be talking about is sustained talk and change talk. And the first point about sustained talk and change talk is that they are intimately connected. Uh, every, everything comes into one or the other. So sustained talk is all about maintaining the status quo. Uh, the desire to keep things the same, the inability to change, the various reasons why we can't change, the need to change, not to change, and commitment to staying the same way. And actually, if you look at these words, you're gonna see desire, ability, reason, need, and commitment. You're gonna see those again real soon. Change talk is any change, any speech in the direction of change. And as I mentioned, all talk is either in the direction of change or not. And one of the real arts of motivational interviewing is being able to keep the focus and keep the emphasis on the change talk and keep the change talk coming. They used to be called self-motivational statements, old term. So change talk, here are those words again. Here are the different types of change talk. And it's summarized by what's called DARN, desire, ability, reasons, and need. So the desire to change are statements like, I wanna change, I'd like to change, I wish I could change. Ability is, I can change, I could change. Reason is the, the other reasons to change besides wanting to and all that. My favorite, one of my favorite examples of the reasons to change is, and this is pretty relatable in the field, say somebody wants a higher paying job, but they have to go back to school to get that higher paying job. Do they really want to go back to school or going back to school is the only way? So the person may not want to go back to school, but they may say, I have to do this. So there's some other reason that takes precedence. So if I do this, then that happens. Um, need to change. Need is that sense of internal or external urgency. I need to, I have to, I've got to. Now, the interesting part of this is that 
all of this change talk does not predict change. What it does is it's the precursor to commitment speech. Commitment speech, I'm going to change. So the research shows that when people get to that commitment stage, they're ready to take action. But all this darn stuff, you have to go through the darn to get to C. And then from C, change happens. And again, this sounds an awful lot like those New Year's resolutions again, which on their own can take years. So that's the darn C. So we got a couple uh, statements here. What type, of, uh, what type of change talk is this? So I think I could quit. Now, is that desire, ability, reason, need, or commitment speech? And how you know is by looking at the verb. So right here we have the verb could. Is that a statement of desire, ability, reason, or need? Could is a statement of ability. I've got to do something about my drinking. Desire, ability, reason, need, commitment. Got to. That's need. I want to recover from my illness. Desire, ability, reason, need, commitment. Want to. Desire. I want to get my kids back, and I can't do that unless I quit drinking. Is that desire, ability, reason, or need? All right, now this is tricky, right? Because there's a want to in there. So somebody out there is saying desire. Somebody, I see you. But does this person really want to quit drinking? No, they want their kids back. So this is actually a reason. If the person wanted to quit drinking, it would be desire. And speaking of which, I'd like to have better control of my drinking. This is desire. And last but not least, I'm going to stop using desire, ability, reason, need, commitment. Going to. And that's commitment speech. So you've heard throughout this presentation uh, talking about advice and basically withholding advice. That's the show. I can't make it any prettier than that. And it's really hard for a lot of us, uh, myself included, um, to be able to withhold your experience and your knowledge and what's helped other people. So, and I really struggled with this early on, and you may struggle with this too. So my suggestion is going to be that you ask that person, are you interested in hearing about something that helped someone else in a situation similar to yours? You don't have to use those words, but something to those effects. You, you ask permission to give advice. Are you interested in hearing about something that helped someone else? You will know non-verbally whether it's a sale or a no sale. If the eyes roll, if they pull back, if they fold their arms, it's not the right time. Save it. Save the story. Save the story for a time that's meaningful. Maybe they'll come back to you and ask about it later. Maybe they'll be ready for it later. So that's the part about advice. You know, in AA, they say the worst advice is advice. And I know that I often find the advice I give is the advice I probably should be taking. So there's a real question about whether advice is more about us or about the client. How we know the difference? Ask permission. So just to summarize all of this that we've been going over, and this has been a lot of material, there are multiple stages of change. Pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance, and relapse. And we move forward and backward through these stages with all of our changes. And this can be a process that takes years. There are strategies that are specific to each stage. So we have to assess to find out what stage the person is in with each thing, and then choose interventions that we reviewed that are appropriate to that stage. Motivational interviewing is designed more for people in the pre-action stages, the pre people in pre-contemplation, people in contemplation maybe preparation. If somebody's ready for action, that's what we've been trained for. 90% of our interventions are geared toward act, the action stage. That's one of the reasons I like motivational interviewing is it's geared toward the overwhelming majority of the people who aren't ready to change yet. Motivational interviewing is comprised of spirit and tools. You remember we talked about the evocation, the establishing that relationship before moving into problem solving, finding out the double bind. And the tools include open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries, the ors that we just went through. And then there's also change talk, desire, ability, reason, need, and commitment speech. Now, these are the materials where we got all this from. I would also add that if you go on motivationalinterviewing.org, that's a pretty much a clearinghouse for all information about motivational interviewing, uh, books, measurement tools, trainings, all that good stuff is all there. Uh, the Changing for Good book, the Prochaska, Norcross, and De Clemente book is also a really good self-help book for assessing yourself, 
what stage of change you might happen to be in uh, regarding a certain issue and then how you can move it uh, forward. We also have on our website a lot of other videos. If you track this one down, uh, you can look up Rutgers. Uh, it's, it's the State Hospital Psychiatric Rehabilitation Initiative or SHPRI uh, website. Be sure to catch all these other videos that we have. They're very similar to these and we cover a variety of topics in mental health. And again, if you have any other questions, you have my contact information on the first slide, uh, feel free to give me a holler. It was nice talking to you and hope to catch you again real soon.